Welcome to Secrets from the Scene, a show for local musicians who want to improve their music, grow their audience, and learn about Minnesota's music scene. If you're interested in talking about all things music related and meeting interesting people from our local community, you're in the right place. Welcome to Secrets from the Scene. My name is Steven Helvig and I'm your host. I'm a local music producer here in the Twin Cities. And today I have Sarah Morris joining me, who is an excellent artist in our community and has been doing excellent work for quite a while now. She's very prolific, both on the music side and on the content side, which we're gonna dive into. I've seen Sarah play in the past and I've listened to her music in the past, but the more I did research on her for this episode, the more impressed I was in terms of all the things that you are doing and doing well too. And in our conversation before this episode, it became apparent that we really needed to dive in and focus on community, building community and supporting community, because I think Sarah is an expert in that area. And I also think that it's one of the most important things that any independent artist can do. It's a topic that comes up a lot in one way or another. So I'm excited to really dive into that and talk specifically about the things that Sarah does to build such a great community and to build up other people's communities and the wider community here in the Twin Cities. But before we do all of that, I'm going to read a little bit of Sarah's bio just to give you some context and into what she's been up to and all the things she's accomplished up to this point. A graduate of the Lawrence University Conservatory of Music, Sarah spent the first years of her career in Nashville, losing herself in the art of writing timeless Americana melodies. In the eight years since her 2011 debut album, Lonely or Free, Sarah's career, like her songs, has been overflowing with delicious details. Her albums, Ordinary Things in 2015, Hearts in Need of Repair 2017, and All Mine in 2020, recorded with bandmates Thomas Nordlin, Andrew Foreman, and Lars Eric Larson, with producer Eric Bloomquist, earned international airplay and considerable critical acclaim, reaching notable positions on both the Americana Music Association and Euro Americana charts. In 2016, Sarah was a top four finalist in the New Song Music Contest at Lincoln Center in New York City, second place winner of the Chris Austin Songwriting Competition at Merle Fest in Wilkesboro, North Carolina, and an Americana semifinalist in the International Songwriting Competition. In 2018, she went on to win the Kerrville New Folk Competition, collecting an honorable mention at the Telluride Troubadour Contest along the way. More recently, Sarah was named Midwest Country Music Organization Songwriter of the Year for the second time. Third time now. Third time, yeah, because they just happened. Third time since the bio app, yeah. It's a lot of awards. That's kind of fun. <laughs> Chris Ryman Schneider of the Star Tribune wrote, Rootsy singer Sarah Mor- Morris offers a Nora Jones-like approach to Americana, smoothing over its rough edges with a butter velvety voice and an intimate songwriting style. Inclined toward the intimacy of live performance, Sarah spends a remarkable amount of time on stage, whether solo, backed by the country kick of her longtime band, as half vintage harmony heavy duo The Home Fires with Vicki Emerson, or hosting local and traveling musicians live online from her big green bathroom, her playful hearted presence is both captivating and contagious. Amidst her steady performance schedule, she has opened for greats like J.D. Souther, Sudi Bagas, and Teddy Thompson. She's had plenty of beautiful moments to revel in. And with a brand new album to share in 2023, she's primed to offer us a few beautiful moments of our own. Deeply committed to the Twin Cities life-giving music community, Morris hosts an online interview program called Hey, I Miss You to amplify the work of her peers as well as collaborating with musicians for a YouTube series of under-rehearsed cover songs filmed in her laurel green bathroom called Toilet Tunes. Additionally, Morris is head cheerleader for a local songwriting collective and I'm sure more. I don't think this is even 100% up to date. Please welcome Sarah Morris. You are so far, so far out of your league. You should leave. You should go before you're in so far, so Thank 
Thank you, Stephen, for for reading that in my face, and then I'm like, oh gosh, bios are so awkward, but <laughs> they are what they are. So you you yeah. have a good bio. Thank you. I was impressed. Thank you. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, there's people. I that all... hired someone to write that. That's a good idea. Bios are hard to write. I mean, I tried to, yeah. and I was like, wait, someone else is good at this, and I will. And what's fun about I don't know if you've ever done that process, but is they mm-hmm. ask you really great questions, and so it actually is an opportunity to kind of figure out yourself a little bit yeah. more. It's like a mini therapy session. Yeah. Well, and it helps you clarify what your brand is in that sense of like yeah. what, what your angle is, Vision. how you're trying to differentiate and stand out and describe yourself. Yeah. 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 No, I think it's all, it was all good. So when people do have good bios, it's nice to, it's to actually read them. <laughs> well, I always start these with letting you sort of talk about yourself a little bit, about your background. You can be as brief as you want, but it's helpful for other artists listening sure. to kind of hear a little bit of your journey, like where it started up to now. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a pretty standard Midwestern, like choir girl, just wouldn't stop singing kind mm. of journey. You know? <laughs> I just grew up singing in my living room. And then once there were options in school besides general music, you know, anytime there was a, if was there a play, was there a choir? Was there an acapella group to join? You know, like I joined it all. And I think at the time I thought, because I loved performing, which I do, but I actually just love singing. And I love the act of singing with other people and and being part of a thing. So so that was, you know, me through high school. I went to Roseville area high school. Mm. So not far from where I've ended up today. And then after school, after high school, I went to Lawrence University, which is a tiny school in Appleton, Wisconsin. But I loved it because they have a conservatory program there. So you can go and focus pretty intensely on music while also getting liberal arts for your other third of your classes. Mm-hmm. And and Laura Appleton was great. I just actually had a show there a few weeks ago and was kind of overwhelmed with gratitude for having found it mm. because it was a really good fit for me. And then I studied vocal performance and music ed there. And I did my music ed student teaching and even after that, tried teaching a little bit, but I knew I wanted to go to Nashville. So I, while I was, I was doing this like long-term choir sub position, saving up money so that when I moved to Nashville, I had, now this is ages ago, so don't use this money for any record. But I had $3,000 <laughs> and I was like, that'll get me somewhere, you know, and it did get me somewhere. I had a friend that moved with me. We found an apartment online that we didn't see a picture of, but we knew the address was close to the Bluebird. And so we just mm. went. and. It was great. It was, you know, it was young and it was a really good town to go have fun in and learn a lot. So I always feel like that was my grad school in a way because I, you know, learned about co-writing, which was my introduction to songwriting. And I learned about harmony singing and I learned about how to be, you know, hopefully professional in a performance setting. And I learned a lot by watching others and dipping my toe into a few waters and Mm -hmm. also clarified that I didn't want to be a country singer, much less like country, you know, like the, the vision changed for what I wanted while I was there. The love for songwriting grew stronger and I got married while I was at that, like in that period of time. And so then my husband and I, he's also from, he also went to Roseville High School. We moved back home so he could go to law school and it was great. It was really good timing. It was like four years was, uh, again, akin to grad school. I felt like I still missed Nashville when I left. You know, I have a lot of friends who stayed and either they're still there, but they don't really do as much music or, you know, it's easy enough to get burnt out in that town. And I kind of just loved it the whole time and left with love. And now when I get to go back, it's like, oh, I thought you were great. You were <laughs> so welcoming. Yeah. And also, there was this delight when I moved home because I could make some money, not a lot of money, but for singing. Right. There were places here in Minnesota that would pay you to sing. Wild. <laughs> um, and so I did that for a few years where I would sing. Actually, the first, there were two places that gave me stage-ish situation. And one was in Excelsior, the Dunn Brothers, so we're, which is very close to where we we're taping today. The Dunn Brothers in Excelsior was, was an initial supporter. and. I could not be more thankful for the way they let me show up there knowing zero things about 
<laughs> how to be a performing singer songwriter, like, or maybe yeah. five things, you know, very few things. And I kept up a decent, slightly growing performance schedule as we had kids. And, but, and I wrote a little, but not a lot. I put out two albums in 2011. Then after having my second kiddo and being a mother for a while, I started to feel weird about the fact that I was telling people I was a songwriter, but I wasn't really writing any songs. Mm. And that coincided with a moment when I had just completed the 12-week uh, book, The Artist's Way. Have you ever done that? Mm -mm. By Julia Cameron. It's wonderful. And I did it with in tandem with my bass player, Andrew Foreman, and my guitar player, Thomas Nordlin, at the time. So it's like 12 weeks walking you through kind of a creative journey, kind of intended to free your creative spirit, maybe get in greater touch with it. And so after that, I was really feeling ready to do something. I didn't know what that something was. And that something turned out to be an invitation from a stranger on Facebook, not to me particularly, but to the world, that they were going to start a group of prompt-based weekly songwriting, a challenge, okay, if you will. And you were supposed to write a song a week based on a prompt and present your song by the end of that week with a video to the internet. This is 2014. It sounded really scary to me, but it sounded like the kind of scary that was perhaps growth inducing, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I talked to my husband and I said, hey, this will look different because I've got the two kids I'll need some time to steal away, you know? I don't know how to write songs while they're here all the time. It was summer and they weren't very old yet. So they were just with me every minute. And what that mostly looked like was I would strap them in the double stroller and take them to the park. And I started writing at that time and still do. Almost all of my writing takes place while I'm moving. Mm. And a song gets pretty well formed before I sit down with a guitar. That's generally the the path. And then after that year, I mean, I've been part of that group since 2014. So every summer we write now 10 songs. Every winter we write 10 songs together. And it's resulted in albums and it's resulted in music videos and it's resulted in me making a lot of awesome friends and it's resulted in me growing ever more devoted to the fact that I think songwriting is just the most fun hmm. and and I get to travel sometimes for music and yeah. Oh, that's cool. So I feel like that's the story. That's great. All right. I want to dig into little pieces of this. Sure. Let's start with the last thing you ended on with the, the songwriting prompt group. Who started it? Laurel Hay. Laurel Hay. Yep. She and her dad and then her boyfriend at the time, who's now her husband, started it based on, there was a national group called, I think, Real Women, Real Songs. I don't know if they still exist. They did a few years and they're always 52 songs. They're a full year. And at that my understanding of that group is it's more like they select 10 writers to who agree to participate. And so Laurel wanted to start that. And I think our first, I don't know how many started that first week, but by the end of the first summer, when we went to the showcase where we like gathered to share our songs, there was only four of us. And now when a session will start out, like our last session in the winter had like 80 people the first week. Wow. Which is totally wild. And it never stays at the first week, you know, yeah. number, but it's beautiful. And the group changes. I'm the one that's been there the longest. And then Pat Egan is, he joined in the winter of 2015. So he's my second longest, but I've met so many fantastic humans that way. Is it all online in person? It's all online, the okay. sharing of it. And then there's one in-person event per session that is, it's optional. We tend to mostly have people in the Twin Cities, but we have Joe from Tennessee. You know, we've got people in Northern Minnesota. We have, I'm trying to think, we've had some overseas friends. So it's very, it's lovely in that way that anyone could join at any time. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Yeah. And it's just free or is it a- Totally free. Okay. Laurel's a saint. Yeah. Laurel doesn't get to write with us as much anymore, but she provides the prompts, which come out every Sunday. We're going to start up again on June 23rd, if anyone watches this and feels compelled yeah. to take the leap. It was so, and continues to be so fortifying in my ability to move through that sense of like, oh, but I wanted a perfect song, because you just don't have time. Mm -hmm. 
And so committing to them, these people, and committing to that deadline means that I get finished songs and I'd rather have a finished song than a perfect song because perfect songs never done. I love that. And I think that's a, a reoccurring theme in my own life too of just done is better than yeah. perfect. Yeah. It, it really is because, or something is better than nothing yeah. is really that's what it comes way down to. Do it. to. Sure. Yeah. And I think it's, it is something that artists tend to get really stuck on a lot. I've been there for sure. Absolutely. And it is something that I feel like as you are, f as you take the dive to whether it's to, to write more songs or to start another YouTube series right? or to start a podcast or any yeah. of the content things, it all becomes part of that. Like you get to a point where you realize there's nothing else that I can do with this amount of time. Like right. this is as good as it gets. Yeah. And if I'm going to do this at all, then I am I have to accept that 80% is fine. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I think that's a really hard trade-off for people. Yeah, absolutely. And I think at some point you just maybe make the commitment, the trade-off, it's better to to do the thing. Exactly. You know, like, and that's what it was for me is I just wasn't comfortable anymore with leaning into that it's going to be perfect. You know, like I just, it, there was just a time where I was just like, oh, I can't live that way. You know, the way I look at it too, because I think that there's like the pushback on that argument is, and there's logic in this, is that, well, you have to put your best foot forward, like first impressions matter, all of those kind of logical things of like, you know, you, if you're putting out something that's not the best representation of you, you might get a bad impression with somebody that you only get one chance with, right? Sure. But generally speaking, because I think that there can be truth to that, mm -hmm. that that fear is way overhyped. Yeah. Because it's just, the truth is, is that the, the greater fear should be that no one will ever see you. Oh my gosh. I mean, when I get really down in the dumps about things, you know, about or kind of worried about music stuff, or this happens a lot at album release, like when I have to go put the album out there, right? Like, yeah. I'm so proud of this, but the work sometimes of sharing your work is... Heart on the heart, exhausting, whatever. Totally. And I just remember like, guess what, Sarah? No one's going to come knock on your door and say, please show me your album. Like, <laughs> that's not happening. No one's going to come to my door and say, hey, Sarah, did you write a song today? You know, like, I don't want that stuff. Do you know Brene Brown? Yes. She has, you know, unused creativity is not benign. And I believe that. Like, it's just really important to me to not be the person who leaves with a bunch of like songs stuck inside of her, you know? Yeah. No. Yeah you're way at a much larger risk of being completely ignored than you are of being judged because that was your 80th, yeah. 80% good yeah. piece of content, whatever it was. For sure. I will put things out and it will be like, ah, you were not my best, but you were the best I could do that day. And, and now we move onward. Yeah. And I think that in the evolving industry that we live in, where it's mm -hmm. like content all the time and that kind of stuff, there's a lot to be gained about just being raw and vulnerable mm -hmm. and authentic in that sense of like putting stuff out that reflects like, this is what my songs sound like at stage one, yeah, at draft one, yeah. that some people can like that a lot. I think that there's room for both in the end. For that sure. You can do things that are like, you just have to be clear about what you're doing, you know, yeah. that like, this is a first take, this is not my best take. And this then, is all I got. And then still release that album that you worked a year on you yeah. know you can do both things and i think that that's a really good approach for people to keep the mindset of like if you think everything has to be that good then what happens is you don't do any social media right and that's self-defeating because without social media that album that you worked on probably won't get heard right and so just breaking it into different camps like it's okay to have some things that are not perfect mm -hmm. but they're doing their job they're serving their purpose yeah and then some things that you really do want to curate and make perfect and then just present them differently. Yes. All right. Well, that was sort of a tangent. No, but, I like the tangent. Um, I mean, I think one thing you said there that really struck for me is that, that I only ever had the time to be raw and vulnerable. That's how this group started. And I think it was, you know, I think now people are even leaning into that more, but it was just what we were doing. And so I feel very fortunate that that is like the culture I fell into and it's, I mean, I write a lot of songs about how we are just all messy people and that's what we got. So I feel like I live into that with those recordings, but then it's great to have a longer form. Like you mentioned, an album, it's not ever going to be perfect, 
eventually that album is still going to have that same place where I'm going to have to press the, you know, fill out the papers that say, this is the paper, this is the album, go print it, you know, Mm -hmm. and it won't be perfect, but it will be, you know, perfectly what it is. And I'll be thrilled with it. And we are ready to move forward. But it is, that's a place where you can lavish a different kind of attention. And, you know, as much as your money will allow, (laughs) it's totally free for me to sing crappy recordings in my bathroom. (laughs) you know, a different experience to make that record, but it is nice to scratch those different itches. Yeah. It's nice to, to go through the creative process and have to reveal draft one. And it's nice to go through the creative process and not have to reveal it until draft five. Yeah. And the albums I've done, like anyone who liked any of those albums could go back and find just about every song in it's draft one state, because most of the albums are songs from the challenge. Okay. Um, yeah. So then I am choosier about what I share with the album. I like to hold on to that kind of until it's really, really, really ready because yeah, because I feel like I share a lot otherwise. So Right. Yeah. Exactly. I think that approach is really great. And there's a lot to be learned from that creative process going in both directions, mm-hmm. that it's freeing to, yeah. to do that to yeah, some yeah. extent. Okay. Going back to your background, though, I want to ask a little bit about your Nashville experience, just out yeah. of curiosity, because there's all kinds of people that are like, I want to move. I want to do the Nashville right. thing. I want to do LA, whatever. What was your plan? Like, how did you approach that? What did you do while you were there? How did that work for you? Well, first I would say, do it. I'd just say, do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, my plan was, like I said, I worked, I had like a specific period of time that I worked two jobs and then a third and I'd saved up $3,000 and I had a friend and we found an apartment and we got there. We didn't know what we were doing. She had made a connection with a temp agency and I was like, I went, oh, I went to bartending school. That's the other way I prepared. <laughs> <laughs> went to the Minnesota School of Bartending over on University Avenue in St. Paul and spent my summer like with these index cards learning how to make, you know, the basic drinks. And so we showed up in Nashville with just, you know, we had gone on one scouting trip just to like make sure we liked the town and we liked it. And I we drove by this like restaurant that was very close to our house and it had trees growing from this roof. And I was like, I think I'll go apply there. And so I applied there and because I thought, well, this is the good way to do it. You're going to get a a job at a restaurant. Oh, the other thing I did to prepare is I had read a book that was essentially, you know, how to move to Nashville if you don't know anything. And it was, you have to write songs. And at that point, I'd really just been a singer and an appreciator of songs. I loved, my favorite artist was Alison Krauss and she mostly interprets other people's work. So mm-hmm. I really thought that was the way to go. But this book said I should write songs because the culture of writing was strong. So before I left, I wrote three songs with a friend and we recorded them and put them on a demo. And I brought that demo with me too. So I showed up in town, $3,000, 25 copies of a CD and uh, a desire to mix drinks at a restaurant. And it worked out great because... I wasn't attached to anything. You know, I didn't have vision of, oh, I will do this and then this and then this. We both were pretty, my friend Kristen and I, like, this is an adventure. And I remember we had two apartments that we lived in while we were there. But the first one, we painted, like, why not on the wall? And then why walk when you can fly, which is a Mary Chapin Carpenter quote. And, you know, I think... We were just there to see what it was. And I'm glad that's how we moved there because it was very easy to then meet. I mean, everyone's doing music there, right? I think Nashville, probably more so than LA and I would guess New York also, it's very, it's pretty condensed. I shouldn't say very. It was very condensed. Now it's fairly phys- like physically condensed. It's not a huge sprawl. Mm-hmm. And... Everyone's involved in music. So wherever you go, you're definitely talking to someone who wants to write a song, mostly. Now it's a lot of healthcare there too. But <laughs> but it was just really easy to meet friends who were down to try co-writing or, you know, and we went to sure. see a ton of music and... Were you performing? It took me a minute to find a place to perform. And the way I did that was I made two very excellent friends right away, Kareen and Tracy. And we wrote together and Kareen was farther along in her time there and so she and she was incredibly generous when she would book a round because that was the most frequent way to perform there okay. or like I think when you're getting started is a songwriter round which in case that's words you haven't heard before it's 
not generally in the round, but like in a circle, but it's three to four songwriters who would share a song and then a song and then a song and another song. And then you go back to the first person and you do it again. Mm -hmm. And so that would be the first way that I performed. And then I joined my friend Kareen's band and sang harmony for her and played horrible tambourine and just had a really wonderful time. They have Nashville songwriters, NSAI is there, and that was a way to kind of get some education if you wanted it or to attend song feedback sessions, which I didn't do a ton of. But, you know, my days would be writing songs and my nights would be waiting tables. Cool. It was good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you end up recording it all there or was it performing and learning still that stage? Um, Nothing that I kept. We had friends that recorded. I had a friend. I made friends with some engineers, one who is an assistant engineer on a lot of my favorite Alison Krauss recordings. And he would do some work that he would hire me for, like background vocals. Okay. We did some demos of some songs, but nothing, nothing really. I waited until I got back here to do a lot of that. Got it. Mm-hmm. Got it. And then once you got back here, you said you started at, you know, Dunbros and mm-hmm. figuring that out. Yep. Which had to have been fairly easy if you'd been performing a little bit in Nashville. <laughs> yes, but I would say in Nashville, because I did rounds all the time, I had not done sets of my own music. And okay. I also had not done covers because at least when I was there, if you were on the cover path, like in Nashville, if you wanted to be a superstar singer, you might take the cover path and play lower broad and and do that. But I knew I wanted to write songs and I, I don't know, that just never called to me. So I, it was the first time that I was playing like a set of music that was covers and and originals interspersed. And it was like the first time I stood as myself and kind of led a show because I would say in the rounds, you're often responding to what else is going on rather than, Hey, here I am. Right. Right. So there was definitely a newness to that Mm -hmm. and a huge learning curve. Okay. It was, yeah. You get back to Minnesota, you get into the city, you're performing, Mm -hmm. you start making records. Mm -hmm. Were you touring at at all? Nope. Okay. I didn't do any touring until after, I didn't do anything remotely looking like touring until 2016. So that was after my 2015 album, Ordinary Things. And yeah, when my kids were already around a little bit and sure how did you put together a band once you got back into town and like find the team yeah i love that question because i love that story in my life it's all been super organic and very like you know looking back on it now you're like oh this person led to that person led to this person when i first moved home my husband played guitar with me Mm. because he's a was a good guitar player. He's an excellent guitar player. He just hasn't touched the guitar now in years because he does other things. But And my brother would play bass. And then my brother's best friend, Eric Bloomquist, would play guitar also with me. And then my husband was in law school, so he had to stop playing guitar. And so it was me and Eric and sometimes my brother. And then I found, I was singing in someone else's band and playing guitar, backup guitar. I don't, that was through MySpace when I moved Mm -hmm. back. Her name was Brianna Ruby. She's great. And through her, I met Rebecca Paddock, who is a violinist and a harmony singer. And Rebecca agreed to play with me. So that was awesome. Then Rebecca was getting ready to move and Eric was getting ready to open a studio. And so it was kind of this shifting time. And my dad offered to look on the internet for me to at some website to find a guitar player because I had I had a, kid, a young, young kid, and I just didn't know how to do it. Because while I was out there performing, I didn't know a lot of musicians. I was sort of in these isolated shows where I wasn't running. I wasn't playing like triple bills with other bands. Sure. So I wasn't meeting a lot of people other than other moms with young kids, you know? They didn't want to be in my band. <laughs> so my dad found these two guitar players, one of whom, when he showed up to meet with me, I realized I'd been his teacher three years earlier. And I was like, that's probably not a good idea. And then the other was this gentleman, Thomas Nordland, and his playing was beautiful. He had, there was one video he'd posted that kind of gave me hot club feelings. Have you ever gone to see a hot club? Mm -mm. Hot club is like a type of, it started in the 20s in France. Django Reinhardt is this guitarist extraordinaire from that era. And when we lived in Nashville, 
it's a very specific sound. And my husband and I would go and see hot clubs and we just loved them. So I think I was inclined towards Thomas's playing because it just gave me enough of that vibe. And Thomas and I just kind of got to know each other. And then at some point I needed a new bass player because my brother was moving to New York. And so he was like, well, how about my friend Andrew Foreman? And then at some point I was like, well, I think we need a drummer. And Andrew's like, well, we've got Zach Schmidt. He's my friend. And I was like, yeah, let's play with your friend. And then when like Zach had to step away, I was like, well, who else? They said, well, try our friend Lars. And so my general thing has been, I love playing with you. Who do you want to play with? Right. And so Thomas now has moved to Mexico. Go Thomas. And it was at one point I found his friend Dave Mailing, who like now plays with us and produced the last album. And Andrew moved to Greece. Go Andrew. And so we, a friend, Nick Salisbury. And so even when I'm looking for subs, it's always just like, okay, well, who do you want to play with? Because what I've learned is like, if they're happy. I'm for sure going to be happy. Right. Done. Right. So. Yeah. And it's such a common story. It's it's a common question and a common story. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Even though I think sometimes that can be a frustrating answer of like, it just sort of happens. It falls together. But, you know, the question of how do I, how do I get started? How do I get this band sure. going? What do I do next? And it might be ask your dad to look on the internet for you. Um, and it's a lot of saying yes. I yeah. mean, like, it's a lot of saying yes to what someone else, what someone else suggests, right? Like mm-hmm. one of the principles that's been very enlarging for me in the last decade or so is the improv idea of yes and. Like when you're in a partnership and someone does a thing in improv, you say yes and blah, 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 you know, and we're taking a train to Mozambique, you know, whatever. Like that's the spirit. And I think anytime I've leaned into that, it's benefited me, you know, with all of those people that I've gotten to play with. It was someone else's you know, here, what about this person? And I just say yes. And that has been good. Yeah. So little tiny leaps of faith. Yeah. I think a lot of it is trial and error, unfortunately, mm-hmm. or fortunately, depending on how it works out for you. And just trusting and trusting your gut and the people around you and just trying to cultivate the best relationships you can. Mm-hmm. Cool. Well, I want to talk about some of the stuff that you're doing outside of music. Well, it's connected to music, but it's uh-huh. not just recording and performing songs Mm -hmm. first and foremost toilet tunes yeah because you've been at that for a while now and it's a great series tell people what it is and how it began toilet tunes is a youtube series airing fridays at noon currently on a weekly basis where an artist and i generally local but i've had some people from out of town we under rehearse a cover song we sing it and then i interview them in my big green bathroom i tape it on my phone I throw a couple of like credits on via iMovie and I put it out to the world. It's very, very lo-fi. And it started again with a lot of yes saying, you know, I have since started things on purpose, but mm-hmm. Toilet Tunes was not that way. Okay, I was kickstarting an album and trying to come up with tiers, you know, rewards. And I wanted to offer that I would sing a dedication song of some, like for a certain amount of money because I'm of the Casey Kasem generation, so I thought that would be fun. And I was already putting out videos of me singing in a bathroom through my original songs, because the reason I started singing in the bathroom is because it's the one room in my house with locked doors from my children and my puppies. (laughs) So I had put out this offer, and I had a dear friend from high school who said, yes, I would like to support your record at that level, but can I actually sing the song with you in your bathroom? I was like, sure. You know, why not? Yeah. And because she was someone we'd done theater together, it just seemed really fun. She picked the song and we just put it out on Facebook, like immediately. And, you know, people liked it, said nice things about it. And then another musician said to me a few weeks later, like, hey, could I ever sing in your big green bathroom or your green bathroom? We didn't call it that yet. And I was like, sure. And it happened again. You know, so the first year I probably did eight episodes and maybe two of them were me saying like, hey, can we do this? But most of them were people just offering. And that was really cool. And it was always very spur of the moment. At that time, we would just tape it and put it right out. And that kept on that way till 2020. And I started increasing how many 
there were, you know, they sometimes were weekly, sometimes it, but it was fluid. And then low commitment, so super yeah. low commitment. It was just during the day, that was the only thing it had to be was when my kids were more likely to be at school and mm -hmm. very fun and just the song. But then COVID happened and mm -hmm. my bathroom was not that big. And so the tunes went on hiatus. And about a year and a half into that, I started really, really, really missing. I did a series of it. I called them toilet tunes, like from the big green backyard. So where we stood outside and we were distant. And But I started missing connecting with other artists, as a lot of us were. And so I devised this idea. I had this thought on a run. I was listening to Seth Godin. Is he someone you're familiar oh, yeah. with? And <laughs> I don't know. I was listening to him, but I was also like daydreaming. And I just had this thought like, oh, I should start a new series with the split Screen, interview. Yeah. It's called Hey, I Miss You. Mm. My friend Graham is my first guest. Like it just, it all like popped into my head right away. I had two questions that I w wanted to formulate it around. And so they would show up and we would do the split screen interview. They would play two songs of theirs like throughout the, and the crap, you know, audio's crummy and you can never ba like count on the tech working, but it was really fun. And that was my first dalliance with programming the episode. So I would tape it and then put it out on a scheduled time mm -hmm. because that was something that Seth Godin was talking about. It's like having something dependable. Mm -hmm. And I, we needed dependability in that world. The world was changing all the time. So I liked having something I could say, you don't know what's going on this whole week, but you do know that, hey, I miss you, will be there yep. at noon on Fridays. And people, the same people would show up to have their lunch and watch the show. And that was really, really fun. And so I did that. And then when it was time to have people in the bathroom again, I was kind of sad to let go of the interview portion of Hey, I Miss You, because I loved learning about these people that I thought I knew, you know, but I still, there's still room to learn more. And so then Toilet Tunes came back in its current form, which is we pre-tape the episodes, but it does air Fridays at noon. It is us doing a cover and then we do the interview and it's just great, great fun. I think it's smart. I think it is an obvious community builder. It, yeah. I'm sure it's just enjoyable for you. Oh my right? gosh, it's so fun. I could go out and see a lot of music and try to connect with people and maybe talk a little, but there's like a martini shaker in the background and a coffee frother and it's hard to hear and it's hard to, you know, you've got that pre or post show energy. And so I'm a daytime person. So I love the thought of like, I'm sitting with you, musician who I admire in the sunlight and we're having a little bit of a talk. And, mm. you know, mm -hmm. it's a good thing. Yeah. I mean, going to shows is great, particularly mm -hmm. when you're young and you want to be out late because you don't do a whole lot of talking during the show. Yeah. You do it after the show. Yeah. And so it just gets to be later and later and later and right. nothing wrong with that. We've both done that and been there. Sure. But it becomes more limiting if you have kids or you have yeah. a, an early job or just other commitments in your life that don't allow you to go out all the time. So finding other means to connect mm -hmm. with people is really important. And yep. I love that you just, no matter what sort of limitations you have in terms of time or you know anything, right. you just work and like, what's the most creative thing I can do right now? Yeah. And it was, I can invite people over and record 25 yep. minute episodes in my bathroom yeah. and make it work. Yeah. And it's, it's a really cool series. Thank so you. my next question is, how has it impacted your career? I mean, it's made it possible for me to meet people easily because I, again, all the limitations of the live performance meeting, it's just, it's hard, you know, and life, you have lots of things to do. So it's allowed me the opportunity to collaborate with people I never would have been able to otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, I love that. And I am super honored that people say yes, because I know, you know, back to our perfectionist, like talking, I'm asking people to come and share something that they hardly know and that is not going to be edited. And that's a big ask. And sometimes they don't even know me. I mean, How there many are people, people say who, no. I've had one or two people who say like, it just doesn't feel right for them, you know? Yeah. And I totally, I love a no. I love a no because it helps me trust someone else's yes. Like, sure. I really respect that people have a level of comfort with what they're putting out, you know, yeah. into the world. So it's changed my life in that way that it's allowed me to get to know people that I wouldn't have otherwise get to know. It's allowed me to collaborate with people I wouldn't get to know otherwise. It has taught me so much about technical things or about some kind of like small business, even though it's not really a business. But, you know, 
that sort of thing. Well, you have sponsors. And- I do have a sponsor. I have a sponsor. Um, yeah. And then I think the other piece of it is that it's shown me how bringing people together from, you know, we from all over the place is possible in a virtual way. way. Like I know who's going to show up for Toilet Tunes. And I know that Wiley is usually going to be there and he's in Washington, D.C. And Roberto from Miami and, you know, David from Anoka. Like we're all going to hang out together and we might never all meet in real life. But there's just such a joy to me that we can be that way. Live streaming in the pandemic was super special to me. And I think we really grew a group of people who enjoyed just seeing each other's names pop up. Mm. So I don't know. One of the reasons we make music, I think, is to connect with people and to help people feel seen and connected. And I think having a weekly hangout is a good way to do that. Agreed. How has the show grown over the years? How long has it taken to get it? You know, like, was it a really, really slow start and then you saw it or has it just been steady and slow? Like By any like viewership metrics, it's actually gone down since... I switched it to YouTube because it used to be just the song. Sorry. It used to be just the song. And it used to be shared on Facebook where the sharing was very easy. And so I was only Uh asking people to watch four minutes, maybe six minutes. And people, they were a little goofier. People shared them a lot more readily. So in that way, it actually hasn't grown. I think it's deepened, which I will take that. Mm -hmm. Because post-pandemic, I just decided I didn't want to to be on Facebook anymore. And I have yet to learn reels. I have yet to like figure out a way to put it any, I'm not on TikTok. Why not? Why, why'd you take it off Facebook? Because I wanted to go the longer form. Okay. And I wanted it to be mine a little bit more. YouTube feels a little, like I, I can control the sharing more. I got increasingly disappointed with the way the algorithm would like share some things and not other things. And I don't know. I just liked the cleanliness of here's the link. Sure. It's here and you can meet me there at noon and I just- You get more of a channel like with YouTube versus Facebook. Yeah. If my goal was growing viewers, there's a lot I could be doing. There are days where I'm like, maybe I should make that my goal. Currently, my goal is not that. You know, I'm- Well, yeah, that was actually one of my questions. So what is the the end goal? Just connecting to people. Okay. The other thing that I do, because I have this blog also that I've been doing the last year called About That Song. As a performing musician- I get, as we mentioned earlier, exhausted by, here, please listen to my thing. Here, please share my thing. Here. Yeah. And so I've wanted to offer other musicians things like I can share it. You know, when someone comes on Toilet Tunes, when they leave my house, I'm like, here's the deal. It's going on at Friday at noon. I would love it if you could promote, if you could share it. I'd love it if you could be there for the live viewing. And also, if it doesn't work for you right now because of where you are and some sort of publicity cycle, that's fine. Let me lift it for you. I want to offer that because I believe in what people are doing. And I, you know, that's my goal is that there's other ways to get other musicians out there, you know, that again, going back to the people I know that are going to tune into Toilet Tunes, like I'm going to connect them to their next favorite artist. Great. That's what I want. Got it. Yeah. I don't watch the numbers probably like a smart business person would. I've not met the threshold to monetize on YouTube. I would like to. Yeah, I don't know what that is even. I'm, I need I'm, to, I know I'm not there. Right. <laughs> well, I have enough subscribers, but I don't have. So if anyone's watching this, yeah, you need a uh, ten thousand watch hours within a calendar year. Okay. And the calendar year resets every day, so it's like something would need to uptick. I'd need one thing to get like a good viral push in order to meet that threshold. Ten, it would 10, be watch delightful. Hours. Once you hit it once, do you have to maintain it, or does it just? I don't know open that because I haven't you? hit it yet. Yeah. I'd like to learn if somebody wants to watch it. If somebody wants to watch, you know, all the episodes of Toilet Tunes and then share them, then maybe we'd discover. Well, we'll certainly be linking over to it. So (laughs) if you've got extra time, go check out Toilet Tunes. You don't even have to watch it. Just press press play. (laughs) Just put it on another tab. That's right. People do that. But I encourage you to watch it because there are a lot of really great artists on there. And the format's fun. I think there's a lot of personality in it. And, you know... I. It, I think it's also inspiring to see other artists that are trying to do the content thing and mm-hmm. try to show up all the time. Yeah. And you have done that. You know, you have stayed on the radar for a long, long time. Whew. You've put out a lot of records. You've seen a generation 
come through at yeah. this point, right? A couple. Yeah. I'm definitely feeling that, like, look at how the the youth is, like, yes. really amazing right now. Right, where you can see a new artist and go, oh, it's you're in that moment. Yeah. And it's hard to explain. I guess what I'm getting at is that when you break out and you have some of that excitement and mm -hmm. people are in and, and there's opportunities coming and all that, there's buzz around you and all that. I think you've probably felt that yourself at times, at different times as, Maybe. as an award-winning That always feels very nice. Artist. I don't feel like I ever broke out. I think my story's a little different, but I've witnessed the breakout for other people. Maybe even taking the term breakout out of it, of just like sure. where there's some buzz and there's some sure. hype and there's opportunities coming in and things like that. And you're riding that wave of like, this feels easy. Sure. And then that always fades. At some Absolutely, point. it's going to fade. It always fades. And I think that's a lot of times where artists then sort of disappear. And because it be stopped being easy and natural yeah. and organic. And I think that that cycle happens faster now. Yeah. I think it's, it's even hard to get the buzzy part to even start as much as it used to be because it's just how many people are doing it, how many people are, are online, how many people yeah, have yeah. access to doing it. And for better or worse, it's just how things are now. And so it's those, from my opinion, it's those that are able to find ways to keep showing up. And it doesn't always mean that you're going to be able to make a record every year or, you know, do the right. things that you would prefer to do every year. Yeah. And it's about being creative and finding other things. Yeah. And that that's where the longevity and the sustainability come into place. And I yep. think you've just done that in multiple ways. Mm. Toilet tunes, songwriter workshops, the the blog now that you're yeah. writing for and and other miscellaneous things I'm sure. Oh, there's but, miscellaneous. Yeah, and I just think that that's such a healthy and smart way to keep mm. a career going. And has it just been because you're sort of insatiable and you want to create a bunch of things, or has it been conscious of like I need to create something new? No, it usually blessedly comes from a desire to connect. I mean, the new thing generally comes from some wisp of a desire. And then I listen to that desire. I think that, you know, way early on, when I started to really dedicate to songwriting and album making and all of those things, as a mom, a why for me became like showing my kids how to keep showing up at this thing, you know? And it, also, I don't want to I don't feel like I have other marketable skills to go get a different job. This is my job. <laughs> so keeping that why in front all the time, like being conscious of that has been helpful. I have two things that I do on social media that aren't even a thing, but they are. And they were both born out of sanity, like gratitude, needing for my own mental health to dig into gratitude. And one was started in May of 2020. I, I run every day. And I started taking a picture of a son, my, of the, the run, like the sky or the forest that I run through and sharing on Instagram and writing some little caption with a heart emoji because I needed to stop, pause and like see the beauty in this place that I was going to see again tomorrow. I needed to be reminded that everything is always changing, even if we're, even if you're just running through the same forest every day. And so I started doing that and I've done that for you know, four years now. And I have wanted to, I've been like, oh, this is silly. And as soon as I'm like, I don't know why I'm still doing this. Someone will be like, I'm really grateful that you post the sunshine post, you know, because it just like helps me to know this. And I was like, that's why I do it. I do it for you. And then about a year and a half after that, I was feeling real funky. My kids had, I was just another period of time that was of like deep change. And I was like, I need to get in touch with gratitude because gratitude Bar none is like the pathway to greater ease in my body or, you know, potentially joy if we can get that far. So I sat down one Friday and within, hey, I miss you. I would always ask this question, tell me something good. That's one mm -hmm. I, I yeah. still do, toilet tubes, every time. Tell me something good because I love that song by Shaka Khan. Tell me something good. Can't get over it. Would love to sing it someday. But so I just wrote down, tell me something good. And I put five pictures of good things I saw in the world that day, that week. And I said, does anybody want to share it with me? And people did. They told me they're good things. And so I showed up the next Friday and I was like, I'll do it again. And then I just kept doing it. And at some point I was like, well, now I'm committed to doing this. I didn't think I would be committed to doing this. And that has no financial benefit. You know, there's no, there's nothing about that other than Gretchen's probably going to show up and tell me your thing. And I love hearing what was good for Gretchen and, you know, sometimes Doyle. And 
there's a guy from Australia that will tell me what's good in Australia. And it's amazing. So to your point, these little things that I started to keep showing up, they always come out of like a real, you know, Sarah person. What do I need? What do I want? What am I looking for? What am I craving? The idea that maybe someone else is craving that same kind of connection right now. Of course somebody else yeah. is. Yeah. The world's a yeah. huge place. It's a world's a huge place. Everyone's going through stuff. Everyone has different needs that are going to be similar to yours. Mm-hmm. Um, and the thing that you have to keep in mind that no matter how small it might feel to you, yep. it's probably really important to somebody else. And yep. then if you put your business hat on and you start thinking about how to market it a little bit, it'll actually grow. And you know, sometimes it happens automatically without trying. Sure. But a little bit of effort too of like, hmm, how could I make this more accessible or more widely discoverable so that it can help more people or share this feeling with more people? And that's what yeah. we try to do with our music. It it's is exactly what we're, trying, what we're to do. trying to do. It's just now through another piece of content that's probably easier and free to make. And for me, I'm very easily pleased. So like, is it one person that this matters to? Sweet. Yeah. I meant it for you. Yeah. You know, I've thought... That it might be smart to move some of those things to one place. Like, what if I did it as a website thing? Mm. Would that be smarter? But I fall down on, it's just, this is where people are. Yeah. And so I'm just going to meet them there. I don't feel the urge at this point to like either of those things that I shared for you because they are this authentic desire. I mean, tell me something good actually takes like a fair amount of work because I'm very, like I sit down and I scroll my thing. And I think, well, what were the five good things? And I link to people's music if it was a good, you know, recently, do you know Dylan Hicks? He's a local musician. That sounds familiar, but I'm not like, I don't know his music, but I've seen the name. Someone turned me on to his song from 2021 called Tyla Tharp. And I love that song so much. And so it was Tell Me Something Good. So then I linked to it. And my hope, my dream is that someone else discovered that song and it was what they needed, you know, or I read a lot. So I link to books and. So it takes a fair amount of time and there have been times where I'm like, should I be engaging with this more with a business hat? But the heart of it is always becomes what's more important to me. So, sure. So I don't. But I mean, all of those things would just be like, put them in a newsletter. and Yeah. And I do have a monthly newsletter yeah. as well. In fact, today was the day where I spent five hours making sure that was in order and yeah. linking to who I'm loving and, you know. Yeah. I think that's yeah. great. And then yeah. that then has a, a business objective at the end of it too, that you can sure. grow that. And I have a Patreon community and that's actually where, I mean, if we're talking business hats, like, mm-hmm. and I have not done work to grow that other than like, let that be pretty organic. But having the Patreon community, those are people that have a monthly subscription of three to $10 usually. That's like what I consider like, that's my, why I can pay, do toilet tunes. It's like, that's my, that's my, they're my bosses. That's what I would say. <laughs> They're my bosses. I'm, gra- I'm glad you brought that up because I wanted to ask you all about your Patreon. When did you start it and why? Started it in 2019. So it's just about to have its five-year anniversary because I was getting ready to make All Mine, which was going to be my third album in this kind of like these albums that go together in my heart. And I didn't want to kickstart. Kickstarting always makes me kind of want to puke a little bit. It's a tough it's one. It's worth it. Yeah. But, you know, but I just didn't have it in me. But the Patreon model felt true because I already was doing steady releasing of things. At that point, it was just the new songs and the toilet tunes. But I think for a lot of people, they get scared by Patreon because they're like, oh, I have to produce more content. And I was like, well, I do produce one specific thing for them every week, which is a love letter. But it is what I would do anyways. And I tied it in with that album And anyone who joined within a certain period of time got to have their name in the album as a producer. Mm -hmm. And that gave it a really nice push early on. What was amazing about it was because I started that pre-COVID, like those were the people that showed up to all the live streams. I mean, that was the group that really started to feel connected. And when I was heart-wise, you know, kind of despondent or down because wasn't getting to perform for people, I already had that group of humans that I could picture their faces or picture their names. And so I could sing for them. I could stare at my own face on the phone, but I could know that I was singing, you know, for Joel and Beth. And sure. that mattered. Yeah. So you said that you you haven't done anything to grow it or whatever. Not really. I was thinking like I guess should because it's been five years and I yeah. want to celebrate them. And honestly, the amount of things that I've told you that I do, like they're just for so many hours in the day. And sometimes I'm like, well, because I'm also performing a ton and I'd like to grow it. 
And I thought like, oh, do I put tell me something good over there? And I was like, no, because I want everyone to access it. You know, yeah. we'll think about it. I follow a lot of people on Substack and I am familiar with the model of this post is open for everybody. This post is locked. Yeah. You know, there's things so like maybe that. Restructuring some of it just to be. It's. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. I don't know. How has Patreon changed your career or hasn't it? No, it's made music making more viable through a period when there was no income, you know. It's not like it is some giant sum of income, but it definitely But it's helps, significant. But it helps. Yeah. But more important, it's like it's so easy as an artist to get, oh, should I still be doing this? Look it. They said I should do it. You know, that's that's like the game, that's the trick for me. When I started the Patreon, I painted hearts on these pieces of paper and I painted a hundred and I wrote everyone who signed up I wrote their name on a heart and I stuck that on a bulletin board so I have this like tangible reminder on you know the downest day like look at these are the people who said keep going yeah so that I, I think that's the relationships that I have with those people that's changed my career because it's really valuable just like my kids are my why they're my why, you know, to sure. know why, to know why you're doing something. And I'm not saying that I'm impeccable in this every day, but but it sure helps get through the humps and through the natural cycles. Yeah. And I have this coming year or this year that we're in right now, I've been doing a once a month show at the White Squirrel, which is a bar in St. Paul. Mm -hmm. Patreon means it's, well, financially, it's again, a buffer that I can pay musicians because that's kind of the deal for that show is like, I'm going to maybe pay out right there. And if we're just, if we're getting nitty gritty, because yeah. I don't think there's any reason not to. But more than that, it's again, now these people are meeting in real life, you know, like now Paul is meeting like the Durkies and, you know, <laughs> Gus is always in charge of the tip jar and Rick Graft, who's this amazing human who runs my merch all the time. You know, it's getting to see people meet each other is something that really lights me up. And so that's been another beautiful outlying of the Patreon. I would have never have had the courage to say, oh, I'm going to have a series of my own at a, a show. Like if I didn't, if they'd already not shown me that they show up. Sure. You know? Yeah. Yeah. The community building, which is what we've been talking about all episode, although mm -hmm. not necessarily always directly. It has so many things that contribute to a career. It has, obviously, it can have financial benefits of Patreon backers, right? Mm -hmm. And then it can have just the emotional benefits of being able to see these people want me to keep going. These people are here for me. And then it can have other rewards of just indirect of, of seeing people come together are things that light you up in terms yep. of uh, connection and, and meaning and things like that. And you found ways to build community in different ways, whether it's more anonymous and online and whoever yeah. finds it or direct people that are directly supporting you through Patreon and coming to shows and things like that. But being able to have both where you have one that's maybe a little bit more like discoverable social media, it's out in that ether. And then one mm -hmm. that's a little bit more private, like a Patreon yeah. where there's names and faces and you know the people and they're there's in real life connections there is great. And that all leads to things being more sustainable ultimately. Yeah. I know another thing that's really important to you that I wanted to talk about a little bit directly before we wrap this all up is how you also support other people. And you've said this all along of just like liking how it helps other people. And that really that's the motivation behind all of these things is that what, you, what it does for other people more so than what it's doing for you but I know that you also do like some songwriter workshop stuff too, or is that just the prompt thing or is there more beyond that? Uh, in the last two years, I've started doing that a little bit and it's actually something I'd really like to learn more about and do more because I think, you know, I mentioned this at the top of the episode, songwriting is super fun. Like I, the act of songwriting, just like the act of singing, like this is where I play. This is where like I get really excited and I feel like alive. And if I can help someone else tap into that, I would love to do that, you know? Mm. And I think 
you mentioned the word sustainable, and that's really important to me because I think I've watched a lot of, like you said, highs and lows and burnouts. And when I offered the workshops last year, one of the focuses was like, how can I help you find a sustainable way to be creative where you aren't as susceptible to the burnout potential? But instead you say, you know, come what may, this is just part of, this is just part of me. You know, this is just what I do. Rather than the songwriting workshops that I've offered being anything about like, here's the nuts and bolts of how you write a song. It's much more like, here's how you tap into what you have to say in your heart. Here's how you get over the voice that says you you shouldn't, you know, and here's how you keep showing up at a scary blank page. Yeah. I love talking about individuals with, oh, this is the song you wrote. Like, well, we could do this. And like, if you want to see if it conveys your message stronger, if we move this part here. I mean, that's something I'd also like to do more of because I find like feedback really helpful myself. So, well, I mean, at that point, it's sort of like teaching songwriting or co writing and, yeah. and, or even kind of producing a song and things like that. And obviously, doing a lot of that's going to make, you better at it as well. Hopefully. Yeah. Yes. I mean, you teach something, you're going to learn something for sure. These workshops, are they, how, how are they put on? Is this something public? Like what, what do they look Not like? Not yet. I mean, they've been, last year I got to sing at two festivals that offered, okay. that let me program. One is Lute Song, which is amazing and is back this year. And Molly Mayer is a big community. I mean, she's just an amazing human and she knows how to bring people together. And she let me kind of like program a little I offered some mentoring there and I offered a special concert so I called it the Wonder Wander and so anyone could go to that they just have to go to Lutzong it'll be the middle of week in July and they should totally go it's amazing it's in Lutzen hmm. and then I was at a, another festival called Story Hill Fest where I taught a creative sustainability workshop and then I've done some online through Cold Facts Wordsmith and that might happen again I don't know so it, it's something I'm interested in for sure well yeah. I think it's a great idea and you. you should go bigger with it. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure there's demand for that sort of access to you and to learning from somebody like you. Well, that's kind of you to say. I would, I would like to do, to do more. So, yeah. Well, I want to be conscious of your time, and I know you've got a show coming up too, so we I can do. wrap this up. But before I let you go, as somebody who's made a lot of stuff, yeah, <laughs> you know, you've made a lot of records. You've made a lot of content. You've made YouTube yep. series. You've wrote podcasts and or, uh, blogs. Yep. You've created over and over and over and over again. So this podcast is largely a lot of people that are also creators, of course, but a lot of people that are getting started and trying to figure yeah. it out, trying to connect with other people. What has been your secret to making all this happen? I was going to say we didn't uncover the secrets yet. <laughs> and now, now you're asking, what's the secret? Trust your people. Find good people. Trust your people. That's the first secret. Let yourself be surprised and delighted and keep showing up. Agreed. Is it okay that I had three secrets? (laughs) More the merrier. And sing in your bathroom. (laughs) Sing in your bathroom. (laughs) (laughs) Well, if people want to follow you online, connect with you, see a show, where can they find more information? Yeah. SarahMorrisMusic.com. I'm Sarah with an H. That's got the most stuff. That would take you to my Patreon. That would take you to Spotify or Apple if you wanted to be a listener. Then Facebook is there and YouTube is there and Instagram. I don't do anything that starts with T. So we've not TikToked. We don't tweet <laughs> but <laughs> or X or whatever. Right. I will put all your links in the show notes. Thank you. And I really appreciate you doing this and Thank and you, Steven. Sharing this is and, super fun. Yeah. For everybody listening, thank you. If this was your first episode, thanks for checking it out. Share it with a friend that you think it might help. You know, this show's four local musicians here in the Twin Cities. So, you know, if you know somebody that might benefit from this, please share it around. And I'm also always open for other guest suggestions, other topic suggestions. Mm -hmm. You know, they're usually really helpful. So feel free to send me an email or a DM. All my info will be in the show notes as well. Thanks for listening. Till next time. (laughs) 